Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our monthly Facebook Live talk session. Now, uh, I hope everybody had a very fulfilling uh, dinner earlier on, right? And uh, thank you, really, uh, for joining us on a Saturday evening for this uh, monthly Facebook Live talk session. Now, tonight's session is uh, kindly brought to you by 365 Cancer Prevention Society and also our dear medical partner, Icon Cancer Center. Now, 365 Cancer Prevention Society was founded in 2003 as a social service agency with an IPC status and is a fully-fledged member of NCSS. Now, the society's mission is to serve the community through cancer prevention measures. This is accomplished through health and nutritional uh, education, promotion of healthy lifestyle and lymphatic detox exercise programs. We also provide practical and emotional support and care for patients and their family members in their battle against cancer through residential and hospital visitations, counseling and wellness services. Now, always remember, one is never alone in the fight against cancer. We hope you can join our community in our fight against cancer today. For more information and to stay to date about 365 CPS, our activities and events, do visit our official website. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Telegram. And also don't forget to like, share and comment on our social media pages so that more people can benefit from our charitable work. Now, likewise, you also see on the screen our partners, uh, Icon Cancer Center, their uh, information where you can follow them also on their Facebook, Instagram, and also their website. Now, um, before we proceed with tonight's uh, program, right, a couple of uh, ground rules, always remember, right, uh, all the information shared at this session by the speaker and 365 CPS are for general information only and subjected to changes. Now, do consult your doctor for personalized and detailed medical advice if you have any, right? Thank you very much. And please remember, if you hear any jokes from me, please do not quote me also. There's also copyright. No, just kidding. Now, um, a bit about our, our medical partner tonight um, that is also involved in this session and also our guest speaker is also coming from Icon Cancer Center. Now, Icon Cancer Center is Singapore's uh, one of the specialist uh, oncology group with nine specialist clinics located across the island in all the major private medical centers. Now, ICON has a specialist team of nine medical oncologists, two hematologists, one pediatric hematology oncologist, two radiation oncologists, and 12 visiting surgeons, providing a full suite of cancer treatments for everyone. Now, so below is their address. Uh, in terms of email where you can uh, contact them for more information. Now, they also provide he uh, health screening. Now, health screening is currently available at their screening clinic at Novena Medical Center. Now, uh, their health screening services are also offered as a one-stop location, so seamless access to all diagnostic services. Now, so you can all, once again visit their websites, right, for more information, right, about their various services. All right. So what are we talking about tonight? So tonight we are talking about colon cancer and understanding the risks and treatment of colon cancer. Now, the itinerary for tonight's uh, session would be uh, we'll be inviting one of our cancer fighters, Miss uh, Sarah, to share with us her tenacity and perseverance journey in fighting cancer and followed by our main speaker, uh, Dr. Francis Chin from Icon Cancer Center will be sharing with us more about ca colon cancer. Then uh, please hold your questions, right? Uh, till the very end, our Q&A session, right? Where you can post your questions on our comment sections uh, for our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Francis Chin to provide you with the answers for your questions. So please, I hope everyone could be very enthusiastically um, asking us your questions that uh, you have your concerns about colon cancer, right? So now, uh, why is colon cancer, right? Why, well, of course, we all know, you know, it's cancer, but 
what's so unique and uh, special about colon cancer that we have to talk about it tonight. And why do we need to also understand the, the risk and the, its treatment? Now, colorectal or colon cancer is a major killer in Singapore. And it's common in both males and females. So it's not a, a sex thing, eh? whether it's a male or female only. Eh? So it's both males and females. Now, it's also the top cancer in males and second most common cancer right, in females after breast cancer. So tonight, we will learn more about some of the facts uh, about the disease, about this particular cancer, and the various treatment methods currently available. Now, so tonight, let's have our cancer fighter, Miss Sarah, to share with us her journey. Right, over to you, Sarah. Hello, Andrew. Thank you Hi, so much. Hi, good evening. Yes, yeah, good thank evening. you very much for joining us. Right, so over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Sarah Lim. I'm 53 years old and was diagnosed with uh, stage 4 breast cancer in the year 2018. It happened that um, one day I random, randomly touched my body and discovered there was a lump at my breast. It was quite big, like a ball, around 2 cm. After going for ultrasound, doctor told me that I had three lumps at my left breast. Um, I was having a lot of uh, mixed feelings during that time. My most difficult moment was to learn to accept the reality that I had cancer. I struggled as I knew that I had to lose my beautiful long hair once I started my chemotherapy. I was so scared of the pain because I heard people saying that the side effects can be quite bad, such as nausea, poor appetite, giddiness, and numbness. I was worried and stressed because a lot of concerned people started to give me a lot of advice regarding food. A lot of food I cannot eat, and it is best to eat home-cooked food. At that moment, I was, it was too overwhelming and stressful for me because in my heart, I did not want to burden my husband and three sons. I was wondering how can I expect my husband and three sons to cook for me every day, every meal. My husband and elder son are working. Second son was studying in the university and younger son was serving in national service. However, I have a lot of support from my family and friends. And from this experience, I learned that no one fights cancer alone. Throughout my journey, I give thanks for my friends and family. I heard 365 Cancer Prevention Society from my pastor and his wife. Um, and of all the activities I participated in 365 CPS, I enjoy that Zentangle art class the most. This is my, this is one of my artwork. This is one of my artwork. Yes, it has benefited me in many aspects. Emotionally, it helps me to express my inner thoughts and feelings through tangling. Giving thanks and, breath and breathing appropriately also helped me to relax and calm down. It also improves my concentration and let me be more aware of my surroundings, learning to be a, more appreciative of the things around me and enjoy nature. My encouragement for the volunteers is well done. Good job for your time and effort in giving. Continue to give with love. We cancer patients and survivors appreciate your contributions. And deep in our hearts, we want to say thank you for your love. To every one of us, we really need your support. And my encouragement for the cancer patients, no one fights cancer alone. Be thankful of everything. Live with no regret. Do the things you desire in your heart. So this is the end of my sharing. Now I would like to pass the time to Andrew. Over to you, Andrew. Hey, Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you for your sharing and uh, also all your support and your well wishes, right? And uh, words of encouragement. Uh, we all feel you. 
Right, definitely. I think uh, we all need the support uh, in our journey in fighting cancer. So uh, that's what 365 uh, CPS is all about. We are always there for our cancer patients and also cancer survivors, including their caregivers. So yes, uh, to all cancer survivors and cancer fighters out there, keep on fighting. We are here all rooting for you. Now, so uh, I suppose everyone is much anticipating um, to, for me to bring on our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Francis Chin. Now, uh, let me just uh, give a brief intro about our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Francis Chin, right? He is a senior consultant in radiation oncology and palliative medicine. He is also a clinical oncologist and was with the National Cancer Center for over 20 years. He is the immediate past president of the Southeast Asia Radiation Oncology Group and is an active principal investigator in trials and deputy chair of Sing Health Institutional Research Boards in oncology hematology now i guess uh, nobody is more qualified to speak about tonight's um subject um matter other than our guest speaker for tonight dr francis chin so let us uh, have a warm welcome for our guest speaker for tonight dr francis chin please dr chin good evening and welcome i have to say the famous lines very sorry, doctor, you're on mute. <laughs> Kindly unmute yourself. No worries. Yeah, good. Sorry, guys, for a bit of so a sorry. technical yes. delay. No worries. We do understand that. Right. Thank you, Dr. Chin. Thanks for having us. Yes, and, thank you uh, very much, Andrew. Us. Yes. Right. Um, so so over to I'm you now. here to talk about colorectal cancer. Yes. So, uh, and understanding the risks and treatments. Um, cancer is actually an increasing problem all over the world, not just in Singapore, but in various parts of the world. We can see the number of cancer cases increasing. And specifically in Singapore, it is one of the top three killers. And the top cancers are breast, colorectal, lung, prostate, and gynecological. Andrew has alluded that colorectal is an important uh, cancer in the whole population among male and females is actually the top cancer. Almost 9,800 patients in the five-year period from 2011 to 2015. It is the top cancer in males and the second cancer in females only behind breast cancer. And the worry thing, worrisome thing is that it is an it is rising in incidence, and this is uh, what we could see. Uh, this slide shows uh, data from the Singapore Cancer Registry, and this is for the five-year period uh, from 2007 to 2011. And when we break it down yearly, you could see that even year by year, there is an increase in cancer cases. And up to 2011, 2015, the trend is still clear. The numbers for uh, up to 2021 have not been out yet, but there's a clear trend that in Singapore, uh, the incidence is rising. And 2014 to 2018, there were almost 74,000 uh, cancer cases annually reported uh, for, for the whole period. And uh, in this, for colorectal cancers, they are, again, the number one cancer in males and the number two cancer in females only after breast cancer. So what is cancer? It is when normal cells, uh, they normally will grow and divide and die in an orderly manner. And they have a specific purpose, which is to, to replace all the worn out tissues in our body. But cancer is when some of these normal cells become malignant and grow uncontrollably, and they have abnormal cell division. The reason for cancer could be divided into both genetic and environmental causes. Genetic is some patients will inherit genetic syndromes. They form 
a small proportion of all cancer patients, specifically for colorectal cancer, up to 5 to 10% of all cancers have a family or genetic origin. The vast majority are what we call environmental factors, which could be related to lifestyle, dietary, uh, exposure to carcinogens or infectious agents. So how does cancer develop? In general, it develops because of damage and mutation to the genes and DNA, which control our normal cell division and growth. In cancer cells, the damage or mutated DNA is not repaired. And the DNA that is damaged due to these insults in the environment, such as smoking or viruses. As we know, we are a living body. And as we get older and older, these cells uh, sustain more and more damages. And then the repair mechanisms could be, could be um, compromised. Hence, you could see that the cancer develops generally more in older people. That's the reason why when we get older, the chances of getting cancer can be uh, are higher. To give an analogy and an example, when you buy a new car, uh, usually the car works well until when you come towards the end of its lifespan, um, you find that there will be more and more problems. Um, and suddenly you find that it is normally related to wear and tear. So cancer is also related to our body where there is wear and tear. And some of these cells which come out of control um, finally manifest itself into cancer. You may have heard there are actually four stages in cancer. But even prior to that, I would like to introduce a concept where there are four basic stages of cancer where there is a pre-malignant condition. It starts out with a cell with a genetic mutation. And sometimes these genetic mutations are not repaired by our cells or not taken up or cleared by our immune system. These changes accumulate and they grow until they become large enough to be felt as a lump. More and more mutations need to be accumulated and then they can actually grow into the surrounding areas. And when they spread into other parts of body, this is when we reach the stage four of the cancer. This is important because cancer does not develop overnight. This stage going from A to D may actually be in terms of months or even years. They may be pre-malignant for many, many months. And this is the, the concept when you can actually screen and actually detect these cancers at an early age, an early stage. Um, hence, you have a better uh, chance of cure. This is how for specifically for colorectal cancer, this is a colonoscopy and we are looking into uh, the, the colon. It develops from a polyp and finally flattens out and becomes an invasive cancer that we see on the right. So this process can develop over many months or even years. Hence, screening works because in the interval, if you actually find it when it's still in the stage of the polyp, you can actually have good treatment and the cure rate is very high. I've said that about 5 to 10% of all cancers are hereditary and related to uh, family and genetics. It is very rare. Most of the cancers related to colorectal cancer are sporadic or, or that from the environment. Having an inherited gene does not mean that the person is certain to develop cancer, but the risk of cancer is greatly increased. And there are certain syndromes where the inherited cancer can be of many, many types. They would tend to have uh, similarly cancer of the um, colorectal. They may also have endometrial and breast cancer related. There are some examples called uh, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer of familiar adenomatous polyposis that are specific for colorectal cancer. Currently, 
these people tend to develop cancer at a younger age. Again, back to the analogy of the car, we tend to expect the car to give us problems at the end of its COE period. But if the car has a manufacturing problem from the, from the factory, the problem will tend to manifest itself early on, maybe in the, next, in the first one or two years when you got the car. So patients with inherited or familial cancer tend to get cancer at an earlier age compared with those of sporadic cancers which are the vast majority, and they tend to be to strike patients who are actually elderly or older. Currently, there is a genetic revolution where we can actually sequence all these can cancers, uh, both the tumor and the human, and we know where, and we have a better understanding of all the cancers and the targeted mutations that can actually form therapeutic targets. This is an example of a family tree for someone who may have an uh, inherited uh, cancer. We, as we can see, uh, there is uh, the square is the father, the circle is the female, the, the person affected is in orange, and the ones with slash uh, uh, represent uh, persons who have died. So you can see that the cancers tend to occur in the family as well as occurring at a younger age, typically sometimes even at uh, less than 40 years old. And hence, if you have a hereditary cancer, we will recommend that you do screening early, less than 40 years old. So this is what typically you can find on the scope if you have hereditary cancers and you can get them more than one type of cancer and you can get them at a at a younger age, these are the familial uh, adenomatous polyposis, many, many hundreds of polyps developing and increasing risk of uh, getting cancer from any one of these polyps. So what are some of the cancer symptoms um, to, be, to, to be known? Um, most cancers have no symptom at an early stage. And some of the warning signs of colorectal cancer is when there is actually loss of weight, loss of appetite, unusual bleeding or discharge, any change in normal bowel habits, there's a feeling of incomplete emptying of the bowel. Usually there's pain and bleeding after uh, bowel emptying. And in certain cases where there is very, very late cancer, a person can have jaundice uh, when it has spread to the liver. These signs do not mean that you have cancer, but if they persist, I suggest that you seek your uh, medical attention and we could see at once. What are the risks of cancer? Some risk factors can be changed. Uh, some cannot be changed. For example, uh, we do not get to pick our own parents. So risk factors that cannot be changed include the sex, uh, our own family history, um, and uh, we our age, when we get older and older, we tend to have a higher risk of cancer. Some of the risk factors can be changed and are environmental and related to lifestyle choices, such as um, we can decide not to pick up smoking, or if we are smokers, we can make the decision to actually stop smoking for ourselves and for our family. Alcohol in, in moderation uh, has been shown to be um, uh, uh, cyto, uh, cardioprotective, but in excess of alcohol uh, can lead to different types of cancers, including liver cancer. Um, diet, we should always uh, have a good diet, a good balanced diet full of fiber and vegetables. Um, some sun exposure may lead to an increase in uh, skin cancer. So in general, what are the risk factors of colorectal cancer? Smoking, always a big one. Alcohol consumption, obesity, um, fat people, uh, morbid obesity tends to have a higher increase in colorectal cancer. Physical inactivity leading to uh, a lack of uh, exercise can also uh, cause colorectal cancer and you not need to be obese. 
a diet high in fat and red meat and processed meat has been shown uh, to lead to an increase in colorectal cancer. This is seen in the very famous story where um, Japanese who are born in Japan with a diet high in fish and vegetables and uh, tofu have low colorectal cancer rates. But second generation Japanese who have migrated to America with the same genetics actually suddenly find their colorectal cancer rates increasing very high. A diet low in fruits and vegetables have been linked to colorectal cancer as well as charred or barbecue meats. This may also form a clue as to why the incidence in Singapore is rising over the last decade or so. We have moved from a diet high in, in, in vegetables to one where the diet is the general diet of the population is high in fats, red meats, and processed meats. All these are also related to and uh, give some clue as to why co cancer in general is rising, including colorectal cancer as well as breast cancer in females. Again, uh, there are some risk factors we do, are not able to change, and these are the family history and genetic accessibility. This is a slide just to show us some of the things we enjoy, we can enjoy in moderation, um, but uh, if we can, uh, if we do not smoke, it has many, many benefits, reducing our cancer risk, reducing our heart mortality risk, and reducing our stroke risk, as well as uh, saving money. So, I would like to speak a, a bit about diet because there are many studies exploring how dietary factors play a role in developing cancers. Um, and some of these include that uh, there is the gut where what we eat goes through. There is a theory that the inflammation in the gut relates to uh, increase in cancer. And when you take aspirin, there's a big trial it shows that there's the, just taking some aspirin a day will reduce the colorectal cancer rate. So again, just to repeat, a diet high in saturated fats has been shown to be linked to colorectal cancer as well as other cancers like uterus and prostate. So being overweight is also a, a risk factor for breast cancer, prostate, pancreas, uterus, colon, and ovary. Healthy diet as well as a balanced diet, is always good for our general health. So how do we screen for cancer? What is screening? Earlier on, I alluded that cancer takes many months to actually develop. Hence, we can actually screen for cancer in a patient who does not have any symptoms yet. When we identify these people who are high likelihood of getting cancer, we actually detect it at an early stage. When you have an early stage detection, your chance of cure is high and your, your risk of dying becomes lower. Currently in Singapore, uh, there is a fecal or cut blood test. Uh, it is actually a sachet which you can actually um, put um, your, your uh, send in a sample of your stool and then send it by post and they will check the, the stool sample for blood. If you find blood, they may write to you and ask you to come in for color, color, uh, colonoscopy. So there are the theoretical benefits of, of screening. There's an improved prognosis when you find it at an early stage. This resource saving, uh, there's less radical treatment required. And early detection equals early diagnosis. Early diagnosis equals early treatment. And early treatment is a better chance of cure. Your doctor will consider many factors before recommending a specific screening test. They will look at your age, family history, medical history, general health and lifestyle matters. And you should discuss with your family doctors if you feel you have a particular high chance of getting cancer, if you have a family history or, or in general, if you are elderly, because your chance of dying in cancer if you are Singaporean is one in three. There, what are cancer tumor markers? 
There are some proteins that can be found in abnormal amounts in the blood, urine, and tissue of some patients with cancer. They come in many, many different names. Some of these, uh, what we call CA, CA99, AFP, PSA, CA125. Generally, they relate to different, different types of cancer. CA is for colorectal cancer, CA99 for pancreatic cancer, AFP is a screen for uh, liver cancer, PSA is a marker for prostate cancer, and CA125 is for uterine cancer. How do we manage cancers? In general, the treatment of cancers require the multiple treatment modalities. It is a multidisciplinary cooperation between the surgeon, uh, radio, on, radio, uh, radiation oncology as myself, our medical oncology colleagues, as well as, as uh, our, our specialist nurses and psychotherapy, uh, psychosocial support staff. So what are the treatment options? Again, they relate on the stage of the cancer and generally they will involve surgery, radiation, which is actually using X-ray to treat cancer and chemotherapy, which is actually using medicine given through the vein and nowadays, the, in addition to chemotherapy, there is actually target therapy as well as immunotherapy. So this is just a slide to show you that the types of cancer, and there are now many, many different ways. Uh, the three mainstays, traditional mainstays are surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. But nowadays, there are new therapies like immunotherapy, hormonal therapy, targeted therapy, as well as stem cell therapy, or sometimes known as CAR T cell therapy. So this is a rectal cancer. This is a, a surger, surgical colleagues. When they do a colonoscopy, they will make a diagnosis. They will take a biopsy. Uh, there will be imaging. Uh, and something that is early stage will require a surgical intervention to take it out, followed by radiation if it's suitable. And if it is later stage where there is actually spread to the limb nodes, a patient, a patient may require additional chemotherapy. Again, this is a, a slide, uh, the sum of a patient who has a familiar adenopolyposis. And these are the polyps that we see in the, some of which turn cancerous and malignant. Uh, the smooth uh, uh, gray areas are actually normal tissue and uh, the variegated polypoidal angry looking masses are, are the areas that have turned uh, cancerous and malignant. These are some of the equipment that we have, uh, many, many equipments uh, that we use uh, in radiotherapy to treat these cancers. Our equipment is getting more and more advanced and there are many, many different types of equipment uh, called linear accelerators, brachytherapy, gamma knife, tomotherapy. But in general, the analogy is these are like different types of car brands. Uh, we still use this to treat cancer and to zap the pelvis. And uh, it is as if there are many different types of cars, all will get you to the different destinations. And these are some of uh, pictures of the machines used for for. Uh, that are used on a daily basis. Um, they are big X-rays. Uh, the treatment is not painful. It is done daily, uh, five times, five times a week, Monday to Fridays. Each time, five to ten minutes. A patient does not need to be hospitalized. Uh, they come in, get uh, radiotherapy treatment to the pelvis, and they are able to go home. And it is less disruptive to your lifestyle. You do not need to be hospitalized and you can come for your treatment daily and then go home. They last about five to six weeks. And uh, generally the patients are uh, well and okay. The side effects relate to the area being treated for colorectal cancer. Uh, the general side effects are that of nausea, vomiting, tiredness, and because the pelvis is being treated and it is close to the bladder, there is a small proportion of patients which have a higher chance of urine tract infection. And as well as when they pass motion, it may be painful and it is, uh, there may be blood when you pass motion. Uh, but otherwise, most people tolerate 
it very well, the most common side effect is that of diarrhea. Now our machines are very advanced. Uh, we are able to track the tumor and do imaging before we treat the, the cancer. The last main uh, modality which we often use is chemotherapy and targeted therapy. Uh, there are traditional chemotherapy drugs which are both uh, available as a infusion, uh, intravenous infusion, as well as oral medications. They have been around for, for a long time, over 20 years, and have, have been shown good effect for colorectal cancer. These are, are usually used for uh, patients with more advanced cancer, and it's an integral part of uh, colorectal cancer treatment. More advanced is if they have actually spread to the nodes in the pelvis, or they have spread to the liver or other parts of the body. Um, there are also recently, because of our genetic uh, rev revolution, we are able to sequence the tumors and we find uh, targeted areas, some genes which are called RAS or EGFR. And over the years, new medicines have been developed to target these mutations, which are the cause of these cancers. And they are available. And the trials have shown that the cure rate using these new immunotherapy drugs and targeted therapy drugs are actually increasing and the patients are living longer and longer. So I've come to the end of my presentation. Um, I will, yes. Um, and can I hand the time back to Andrew and we will take some questions for our Facebook Live? Sure. All right. Thanks, uh, Dr. Chin. Thanks for a very insightful and informative uh, sharing. Uh, looks like, uh, guys, you hear it from the doctors or Dr. Chin for tonight. Eat your greens, eat your fruits and lead a healthy lifestyle and avoid the three highs. Right. Look like, you know, as they always say, you know, early detection means a higher survival rate when it comes to cancer. So really, you know, uh, that's the best foot forward really to, to have a high, better, uh, healthy lifestyle, right? And you should start right now and not tomorrow. Don't put off what you can do today to tomorrow. Now, so, right, let's take some questions, right, for Dr. Chin. Uh, we have our very first question from Carl. Uh, I think Dr. Chin, you may have covered uh, the answers to this question, but uh, maybe you would like to add on. Uh, to uh, your answers to sure. how yes. uh, he was asking whether colon cancer can be cured and will there be a cure soon? Thank you, Carl. Um, colon cancer can be cured if it's, treat, if it's caught at the early stage. That's why we emphasize uh, the cure rates for stage one colon cancer are as high as 90%. And if you catch it at stage zero, where there is no, what we call the the pre-invasive non-malignant site when it is a polyp, uh, the cure rates are 100%, you know, and there is actually very, very good cure rates, but the cure rates actually decrease as uh, the cancer becomes bigger and becomes more invasive and as it spreads to the lymph nodes. If you have reached what we call uh, stage four breast, uh, stage four colorectal cancer, uh, out of the pelvis, unfortunately, uh, the cure rates are less than 5% uh, in fire survival. But I've alluded that over the years, we have uh, many new therapies, the new immunotherapy, uh, medicines, the new targeted therapy. Compared with the last 5 to 10 years, we have seen the cure rate gradually increase. And so even for the stage 4s, where previously the, the median survival, that is 50% of all patients, used to only uh, uh, live about a year. They've now become 17 months and now up to 24 months. And of course, it uh, depends on where the, the stage 4 or why it spreads to. We have even long-term or relatively longer-term survivors where we actually have a good uh, quality of life, uh, although we are not able to finally cure them uh, in the long term, but they are able to be controlled. And the trials are still ongoing. And we hope that over the next few years, 
we may, with the genetic revolution, we may even be able to cure stage four cancer. Thank you, Dr. Chin. You're right. You hear it from Dr. Chin once again, early detection, right, is always the best move. But of course, uh, please do not be paranoid. You have any stomach ache and all, you start suspecting that you have colon cancer, but you know, take things in moderation. But uh, if you really do suspect there's something wrong, right, do see a doctor soonest, right? Now we have another question from uh, Eva. Her question is, if genetic test is non-positive, will the parent pass it on to the children? Dr. Chin? Um, usually, uh, if it's non-positive, this is what we call wild type. Um, so there are certain Mendelian uh, genetics. You may, you may not, uh, for example, if, even if you have the gene for uh, familial adenoal polyposis, it only resides in one copy of your gene. Your kid has only a 50% chance of getting the cancer. You know? um, so it's not 100% that you pass it on. So if you are wild type and you do not have the cancer uh, mutation, then you cannot pass it on to your kids. But your kids may develop what you call sporadic type, you know, when they are older, when they are 50s, uh, uh, 80s, uh, like, like the, the car machinery, wear and tear, they may develop cancer itself. As we know, colorectal cancer is, again, I repeat, the most common um, uh, male cancer and the second most common female cancers. And if you are Singaporean, you have one third chance of dying from cancer. Hence, even by itself, your chance of getting a sporadic type of uh, colorectal cancer or cancer in general is pretty high, even without uh, a genetic mutation passed down from your parents. So just a sub question, Dr. Chin. Uh, yes. you, you mentioned that, you know, colorectal cancer, uh, the risks are relatively higher for Singaporeans. Is it because us being Singaporeans, we love our food so much with our unhealthy eating habits, as, you know, uh, we have such a high, higher risk, you know? Uh, no, no, no. Um, no. What I meant is that in general, I have a first slide. Uh, cancer is very high in all countries. We do not have a higher risk compared with developed countries. Uh, in fact, in underdeveloped countries, we find that the people die more from, you know, uh, infectious disease, pneumonia, mm. uh, diarrhea. But when we have tackled all this, and, and, you know, these are just famous last words because now we have an mm. infectious disease ravaging even the rich world. Um, That's right. Cancer and health disease become more important over the last few decades. And there are no specific causes that one can point towards, oh, we love our food, uh, we love our McDonald's, we love our KFC. Mm. But there is certainly a trend that uh, our cancer incidence is rising. Uh, it is a trend that we see all over the developed world all over uh, many countries in, in all over the world. Uh, and the, it's for reasons unknown, uh, but it could be related to how we are, in general, the world is more obese. Mm. Uh, people are exercising less. You know, we, we play computer games instead of uh, uh, working on the, in the fields. Uh, we, we have richer foods. You know, more and more uh, people getting diabetes. Yeah. So these are general trends. Uh, but certainly, there are heartening signs that we are understanding this risk. And then uh, we are taking steps to actually do screening. And the, what I wanted to emphasize, although the incidence is rising, the cure rate of cancer actually is increasing as well. So the deaths from cancer, colorectal cancer, are gradually decreasing over the years. And that, I think, is an important statistic and a very welcome change. Firstly, is the improvement in all the treatment techniques, better medicine, better surgical techniques, uh, better radiation equipment, uh, but also perhaps better screening. We are catching them early um, when they are easier to be cured. Mm. Thanks, Dr. Chin. That's very reassuring, right? So folks, that is uh, one thing that Singapore should not claim to be number one eh, among all things, right? So now... Uh, yes. Another question, right, from the audience, uh, Judy. Uh, actually, Judy has uh, three sub-questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, 
you know, does cancer causes weight loss or weight gain? Okay, in general, if you have cancer, uh, you actually have weight loss because you have a loss of appetite. Uh, you have, and if you have very advanced cancer, uh, there's a phenomena or symptom called cachexia uh, where you do not uh, feel like eating. You have loss of appetite. Uh, and even for the things that you eat, the body does not absorb it for yourself to grow. Uh, the cancer can be can be regarded as a malignant cell that, that sucks all the nutrients that you actually put in. So although you are eating normally, you are actually losing a lot more of your weight. Yeah. So uh, in that sense, they are probably causing weight loss. Yeah. Mm. But these are usually in the advanced cancers. Sure. Now, her other question is, uh, for a woman that has an uh, increase in a uh, womb lining, does it consider a uh, pre-cancer? And uh, okay. also, whether proteins are good or bad? Okay. Um, proteins are, I will answer the second question first. Proteins are naturally occurring uh, substances. They are neither good nor bad. We cannot live without proteins. You know, that we, we can have a low carbo diet, you know, where we don't eat a lot of carbohydrates, you know, low carbo, not no carbo, you know, low carbo diet, but we cannot have a no protein diet because uh, there's never been this fat. Uh, in fact, there is a, a dieting fat where it's a high protein uh, diet because from the proteins, we can make carbohydrates, you know, but protein is quite essential. So in the sense, I would say that it's not a bad thing, uh, but anything in excessive, you know, if you're taking too much of these proteins and without taking anything else, um, your liver works really hard in breaking it down, you know, to change it to carbohydrate, to change it to other stuff, you know. So too much of a good thing uh, is actually, uh, you know, you can actually cause diabetes and, and all this too much of a good thing. Um, the first question relates to if uh, whether a thickened womb lining is precancerous. Uh, the answer is more nuanced than that because the lining of, and I do gynae cancers, um, the womb lining relates to the female's hormonal cycle. Okay, someone who is uh, postmenopausal will have a very thin lining. And if you have stopped ovulating and suddenly you have an increase in, in womb lining in your postmenopausal, then it is very suspicious that this is, is uh, uterine cancer. But for a normal fertile lady in, in the, the state, we, we know that at different points of the estrus cycle, the womb lining changes. You know, it thickens to, to, to a point to be receptive for a fertilized egg if there is a fertilized egg and then it breaks down and then you get a period. You know, so the, the, thick, the thickness changes, you know, and it relates to that. So a thicker wound lining and when you do too much ultrasounds, you can always get uh, different linings at different times of the day, even day to day, week to week is different. It does not necessarily mean it's cancer. Yeah. So consult your doctors if you have abnormal bleeding, if you're postmenopausal or premenopausal and you're bleeding that is out of your menstrual cycle, then they will do an ultrasound, they will check the lightning, and there is always a calculation to give us the likelihood of the cancer. And there's always a tumor marker that we can do, the CA125 that I alluded to uh, prior in the past. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Doctor. Yeah, just to also add on to Judy's question about proteins, uh, I guess we are also very concerned about what to eat and how to eat right. Now, for those who, who wants to know Certainly. more, you can always go to our website, at 365 CPS, we have a library of uh, recipe videos uh, teaching you what to cook and uh, you know some of very easy to make uh, recipes to, to eat healthily, right? So do check those uh, recipe videos out if you are interested. Now we have uh, another question from BC Peck. Uh, he's asking uh, what screening are there for early detection? 
Okay, so specifically for colorectal cancer, there is actually uh, the fecal or cut blood and as well as uh, colonoscopy. It is not on the national screening uh, program, the fecal or cut blood is, uh, but if they are asking screening in general, uh, there is a uh, breast screening program that is national, you know, so uh, if you are if you are a woman of a certain age, uh, you will get a letter from the government telling you, encouraging you to come for a mammogram. Uh, and that is sent out um, when you hit a certain age. So you have breast mammogram screening. You also have, for the longest time, we also have, for as a national screening program, a cervical screening program, a pet smear program, which is both also a letter based. You reach a certain age, we will send you a letter asking you to come. Or if you still have not come, if you have given birth, your gynae will actually do uh, a, a your post uh, uh, obstetric examination. They will do a, a, a screen for you uh, and it's part of the, the process uh, during the checkup. Um, so we want to pick up uh, cervical cancers. Um, a lot of people do... Uh, tumor marker screening. That is not part of the national, but some of the more popular ones like PSA, because they are just blood tests. So it is easy to do. You know, some people may just, uh, if the blood test is high, they will need to do further tests to see what it is. Um, yeah. But in general, try to consult your doctor because not everything uh, needs to be screened or relates to screening. There is an additional, if you see, uh, we have recovered breasts, recovered colorectal, recovered uh, prostate, and, and these are the big ones, gynae cancers. There was one big cancer in my in what lung, you know. So lung, many people have tried uh, CT screening, but generally uh, it doesn't work because the lung tumors actually grow really fast within a few months. So unless you have screening, which is every three monthly doing a CT scan, which is unfeasible, because of radiation exposure, uh, it is still not feasible. Um, so, so it's not, uh, but if you find uh, your CA being high or certain tumor markers being high, certainly, or you have symptoms, certainly you need to go for further investigations. Yeah, that's right, doctor. Now, uh, the HPB currently runs a national screen for life uh, initiative or program for those at least in the 40s and 50s. Uh, where you can actually screen, uh, have screenings on some of those uh, screenings that Dr. Chin actually mentioned. So do inquire uh, on those screenings uh, if you are keen or so-called you think you qualify, All right? So um, Eva has asked another question uh, is that, is the air pollution play, playing a part in cancer to develop? And also is drinking more than three cups of coffee every day bad for us? Okay, I, for some, um, we can't I do will answer coffee. The, the coffee questions first uh, because like anything, um, coffee drinking has not been linked to increase uh, cancer. But of course, uh, all things we need to do in moderation um, and, you know, um, and if you need the coffee uh, to, to perform at a certain way, um, then I, I think you may need it, but try to do it in moderation. Um, so coffee has not been linked to, to increase in cancer. Uh, the next question is air pollution. Certainly, we know that uh, smoking causes uh, lung cancer, and that is unequivocal evidence of it from uh, long-term studies. We also know that in certain polluted cities, uh, like New Delhi, uh, uh, countries in, in China, the number one uh, cancer in China is actually lung cancer, you know, and their cities are, are, are have a higher pollution index. And it tends to, uh, when you have metropolis uh, like Mexico City, your lung cancer incidents are very high. It relates to the PM uh, less than 5 micron, you know, so we, we always say, uh, just to divert the beginning, you know, the haze, you know, uh, we can, the things that you see, 
are actually not dangerous at all because they are uh, microscopic, they diffuse the, the light and we can see it very hazy. The ones which are very, very dangerous are the ones we cannot see, uh, where we, it's less than five microns and they once inhale in, uh, they can actually um, go into your bloodstream and cause cancer. And it in itself, actually, if the pollution index for uh, this uh, five micron is very is very high, you can be very clear there because it does not diffuse the light. Yeah, it is the suit that are too big. Uh, they will be filtered out. Ironically, they'll be filtered out by your lungs, your mucus. So they are not that dangerous. They are, of course, dangerous because they can cause uh, asthma, pneumonia. Uh, but in terms of carcinogenic, it's the ones that we cannot see that are dangerous. Sure. Thanks, Doctor. Now we have uh, another question which is fairly common uh, for us uh, from Yvonne. She's asking whether is it true that when one switch to full organic diet and adopt a healthy lifestyle, example, uh, exercise, sleep well, you know, less stress, one may achieve status quo for cancer. We will always encourage our patients to adopt a healthy lifestyle for themselves. And we find that, uh, I, and I meet a lot of patients who, who are undergoing treatment uh, and treatment is a very stressful process, you know, and I always say, do whatever you, that makes you de-stress or, or, you know, the, often the, the, the biggest question we are asked, you know, does stress cause cancer? And incidentally, there is actually no journal or scientific evidence that says, oh, an increased amount of stress causes cancer. But as a doctor, uh, my own personal anecdote and many, many anecdotal evidence from my patients will say that, you know, I had a very stressful period in my life and I was convinced that this was the one that uh, caused this cancer. And we could say that now we know that cancer is related to an immune system and healthy immune system. When you have a very stressful period, we know that your immune system actually comes down a lot. And this could be the trigger or escape of cancer. Having said that, uh, you know, a good diet, organic diet, moderate exercise, being healthy and optimistic, one must also come for treatment and uh, use generally um, acceptable proven treatment therapy in addition to all these things that you're doing. If you neglect doing proper therapy and try to self-medicate, uh, then you'll be doing a, a, a disjustice to yourself um, because uh, your own immune system may not be able to fight off the cancer. It can when it's a small and when you are in remission. But when there's active cancer, a uh, mass of cells, there are billions and billions of cells, just having your immune system itself will not be able to tackle this yeah, without immune therapy. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Chen. Now we're getting quite a few questions uh, coming from the audience. So uh, some of the answers to the questions uh, may not be in sequence. So please bear with us, but uh, we'll try to as answer as many uh, questions as possible, right? Uh, as long as our time permits. Now, uh, the next question we will take from uh, Chantel. Chantel is asking, uh, will using non-stick pen and utensils lead to cancer recurrence? Uh, and her second part of the question is, can ER positive and PR positive breast cancer survivor eat bread, pastries, biscuits, Milo, etc.? And what are the food to avoid? Okay, I will again answer the second questions first. Um, there is no evidence to say that uh, uh, you need to have a low carbo diet to prevent uh, cancer reoccurring. Breast cancer is, is a hormonal cancer. You know, we get hints solid. It, it, it only happens in the majority of women. You know, if you're male, you have low female hormone. Um, so you won't get breast cancer. There's a one in a million where males can get breast cancer, but that's usually related to family history. But the vast majority is hormone related. So your glycemic index does not alter your hormone profile so much. You know, there are some studies which show that, oh, 
when I actually take uh, uh, a lot of soy, uh, my estrogen, and it's a precursor for estrogen, uh, maybe that may be a, 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 a chance that it's a higher, uh, and it escapes the, the suppression of the medicine that we take. But we also know, and, and, and there's a follow-up study, you need to take a lot of soy to, to achieve this effect, you know, kilo kilograms of soy uh, in a day, which is not possible for a human. Yeah. My advice is you just take a, a healthy diet because in trying to optimize one in a way, you may actually cause more health problems if you do not take a healthy balanced diet. Yeah. Okay. And the first question relates to Teflon. Um, Teflon has been shown to be inert and it's fairly safe for human consumption. There is not much leakage uh, of the, the, the material into the food, but if you are worried and, and, and we could just do it on the normal method, you know, steel pan with oil and yeah. Uh, so of course the amount of, you know, there are certain chemicals we know are definitely carcinogenic but it's also related to a dose, you know? We can, and we know, let's say for example, benzene or petrol is carcinogenic. And some patients who are oil workers, over long periods, at the end of 20 year career, they develop uh, bladder cancer, uh, various types of lung cancer. That's only after 20 years. You know, one can safely, you know, let's say five meals, I, I can actually just ingest benzene and it's a function of dose you know uh, there's a chinese saying it's, it's not just the poison but also the dose you know uh, so that amount of teflon that we are using you know may not be enough or even if slightly ingested flakes may not be enough to cause cancer itself but if you do find that your pen is old and you're worried about micro particles and microplastics i will certainly encourage you to change the pen um, yeah, to a new one and, and try not to get it chipped up. You know, um, we, there's a saying that, and, and this is true, that there's so much plastics in our ecosystem now, you know, with climate change and everything. There, they, there's, a, there's a quote that we are ingesting the equivalent of a credit card, you know, about six grams of plastics every year, you know, which is actually astonishing. You know, what it does to our body, uh, we will not know in the long term. Uh, but, you know, plastics are also inert. You know, you can swallow a plastic spoon and it will come out the other side because it will not be ingested. Yeah. But we will st I will still not recommend uh, eating microplastics or, or, yeah. Thanks, doctor. For one moment, I thought I have to throw away all my uh, non-stick pen, you know, because of Teflon. Right. That's re real assuring. Now, uh, okay, we will because we are coming almost to the end of our session so we we'll take uh, the last two questions so uh, one of the questions would be from alex uh, he's asking our uh, pescarian terrain uh, or mediterranean uh, diet more friendly to the colon yes certainly um, if you look just on the epidemiology of it uh, the the mediterranean diet which is actually high in grains high in olive oil and, and, and light cooking, you know, and raw foods, uh, salads, uh, vegetarian. Um, it, they, they also have, uh, uh, certainly if you compare with a, a Western society, let's say with America, or even just to the UK itself, which is more Anglo-American diet, the rates of colorectal cancer is slightly higher uh, in the American sort of diet. It could be diet. It could be different or oh, the other side of America, but UK is also in Europe itself. Uh, there may be cultural factors as well uh, that we do not understand. But, you know, if you enjoy the, uh, the, the diet, I think it is actually good for your heart health. You know, I think there is stronger evidence to say that the Mediterranean diet is good for your heart. And, and the, the good thing about it is they say uh, wine in moderation actually is protective as well. Yeah. Sure. Okay, we will take one last question for tonight. Uh, that's coming from BC Pack. Uh, the question is: Is X-ray recommended for lung screening? 
Yes, I've actually mentioned it before. Uh, there was a, we wanted to have a national screening program for um, lung because it's one of the biggest killers uh, in, in Singaporeans and we will anticipate it's going to be bigger. Even though we have been very successful in our uh, non-smoking campaign, but we are worried in terms of you know, the haze and air pollution quality uh, and there's still always a baseline of, of bad air. Um, but unfortunately, all our studies relating to x-rays, x-rays firstly is not uh, fine enough to pick up the small lung cancer. When it's big, everyone can see it, but the cure rate is terrible. You know, and lung cancer is a terrible way to die. And when you're advanced lung cancer, your cure rates are pretty poor. So you want to catch them when they're small. So the only way to do that is CD scans. And they can actually grow from stage one to stage three, you know, with the abysmal survival rate dropping rapidly within months. So unless you have uh, uh, very regular CD scans, which is not feasible as a screening, you know, we can do breast cancer screening, uh, colorectal cancer screening, uh, prostate and uh, cervix, because the development of these cancers tend to be slow from the stage A to D slowly. So we can pick it up and then have a good cure rate. But if your development of, let's say, lung cancer or pancreatic cancer is very fast or brain cancer, where something is very aggressive, there is really, it is a poor candidate for screening. But because one day in January, you may be okay. In February, you get, you know, cancer, which you, you the pre malignant cancer. By June, you may actually be stage three, stage four. And that's not even by the time you, you know, a good screening program is only when you are, it's feasible to do it once a year because it has to be a big population group. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Chin. All right, folks, uh, that's all the time we have uh, tonight for our question and answer session. But rest assured, uh, for those of you whose question has not been answered, we will collate your questions and pass on to either Dr. Chin or any of our uh, medical partners uh, that we have on board to uh, share their answers with you. Now, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, yeah, thanks, Dr. Chin. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your enthusiastic participation, uh, Sarah and Dr. Chin, for your sharing. And we hope that you have enjoyed tonight's uh, session and gained much knowledge about colon cancer. But, uh, you know, don't just uh, so-called follow us just for tonight, but uh, stay tuned for our September and also a uh, monthly uh, program because uh, in our September Facebook live talk session, we'll kick off with a talk on CAR T cells therapy in Mandarin. Uh, in Mandarin, it means CAR T C Tao Kang Ai Liao Fa. The speaker will be none other than Professor Lim Ka Ming, who is currently the founder and CEO of the Gene Oasis Group and one of uh, 365 CPS board member. The session will be held on 18th of September at 8 p.m. Once again, over 365 uh, CPS uh, Facebook page. So do join us uh, then. Now for more information and to stay up to date about 365 CPS or even ICON Cancer Center, our uh, activities and events, do visit our official website. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Telegram. And don't forget to like, share, and comment our social media pages uh, post so that more people can actually benefit from our charitable work and support them in their cancer fighting journey. Now, lastly, would really appreciate if you could let us have your feedback about tonight's session, right? Uh, and also what other topics that you would like us to share in the future. Right, so kindly scan the QR code on the screen, right, to give us your feedback. So we certainly value your honest and invaluable feedback so that we can do better and also have more exciting um, talk sessions for line up for you, right? And um, perhaps, you know, you will have any suggestions or questions, right, do feel free to forward us to us, right? So with that, Right. I wish everyone a good night, stay safe, and take care. Thank you very much.